Good evening, all, and welcome to the first episode of What Makes a Night. I'm Lord Calvert Gather, companion of the Meridian Cross, companion of the Argent Comet, companion of the Argent Lamp, companion of the Falcon Fates, and Reaper, coming to you live, as always, from the Barony of the Osprey on the southern coast of Meridians. And for this series, I'm joined by an absolute SCA legend. You may know him from the SCA Coaches Corner or from the fighting field of Argent, Artemisia, and the known world, Duke Sean Kirkpatrick Paragon. Good evening, Your Grace. Good evening, Cal. Thanks again for having me. So, uh, so this t- tonight, I- I'm actually I get the, the honor of introducing the guest because it is the one guest I have chosen for this series. Because, <laughs> in my opinion, he is the probably top five knights in the known world and one of my personal favorites. Uh, so, uh, when I think of the courtly graces, I think of one man, and that is Sir Joffrey McDonald. Good evening, Your Excellency. Good evening, Cal, and good evening, everyone. I was told I need to do a little bit of an introduction. So um, I started the SCA back in 1986. Uh, down in uh, uh, Ansteora, then uh, moved up to Mid-Realm for a while, went to uh, uh, Drakenwald, then back, and I've uh, been, ever since I returned to America, I've been here in Meridies. Uh While I was in Drakenwald, I was actually elevated to the Order of the Laurel for my honoring. Uh, I didn't get to go and do a lot of events there, but you know, every chance I got, I did go. Because, I mean, 2,000 miles to an event is a bit extreme for most people, but we worked with it. Uh, when I got back here to Meridius, I uh, ended up in the very southern portion of the kingdom. So it became very important for me to travel even, even here. So I uh, did a lot of traveling and uh, a lot of fighting, a lot of armoring and so forth. And uh, eventually I was blessed with the acc- accolade of knighthood. Um, it was actually one of the things that I actually did strive to achieve. It took several years. It's not an easy path. They're, when you're dealing with knighthood specifically and any peerage, they're looking at all of the aspects of who and what you are and what you bring to the society. Uh, one of the things I do believe, though, is once you've achieved the accolade, whichever one it is, the job is not over. That's, that's when the job actually begins and gets even harder. So I pushed myself to be of more service to the king, to more, do more things for, for the people around me and so forth. And the end result of that was they, again, blessed me with the accolade of Pelicans. So I am actually a, a triple bestowed peer. But as I said before, that is that just means I got to do more, got to be more of what the SCA needs out of its people, its peers, and so forth. So I'm still, I'm still on the path. Having achieved an accolade does not take you off the path. So my next bit of service is going to be hoping, hopefully helping to inform everyone watching this show about the nightly, nightly virtues. So there you Absolutely. Go. that's a great, great segue. So uh, tonight's episode is on uh, courtly graces. Um, you know, this, this whole series has been about kind of breaking out everything about being, uh, being a knight that is not strictly related to fighting and the courtly graces is kind of a, nebulous term that refers to a, a number of things that are uh, requirements uh, according to Kapora and what it what is required to be a peer um, and to be a knight. Some of these things include, uh, but not limited, not limited to, um, uh, knowledge of heraldry and period games and dance and um, uh, enter- entertainment um, at large. Um, and one of the things that, that my knight had always taught me was that uh, a knight should be able to entertain the crown at a moment's notice. Um, and uh, and that entertainment doesn't have to be. You don't have to have a glorious singing voice. Uh, you can just you can just tell a story. But you should be able to, to entertain the crown. And you should be able to entertain the populace um, at a moment's notice. And so this there's a whole. A whole range of things that that basically make up um, the well-rounded individual and and the type of person that um, that that is seen to have interest in medieval pursuits that are that are not strictly uh, related to fighting. So that's some of the stuff that we're going to cover tonight, um, specifically. Um, and I'm delighted to have uh, Sir Joffrey on with us uh, tonight because, uh, as as Cal said, you know he's one of the guys that kind of inspired the uh, the What You're Playing Wednesday. Um, so knowledge of, of games and, and just, like I said, there's, there's so many different things that, that you can be doing that, um, basically amount to, yeah, I don't know, just good basic social skills in a, in a, in a medieval, medieval court. 
um, you know, and and this is also going to include things like um, how and when to, you know, bow before the crown or how to introduce yourself in court or how to to make an announcement uh, in in court, you know, and and you know, don't turn your back on the on the crown, and you know, ask permission of the crown to uh, to address their audience, and and you know, those little things. So um, that's kind of what we're uh, what we're talking about tonight, um, and that's uh, that's it. So, Joffrey, you have any initial thoughts on uh, some of that? Well, um, I got a lot of thoughts, but how to exactly phrase them, uh, <laughs> which actually goes into one of the things that a person, a peer, or anyone is going to end up doing at some point, as is, is, is Grace was talking about, was, was be put in a position to, you know, address the crowd, address the audience, or make announcements and so forth like that. So one of the things that you really need to be aware of when you're doing something like that, because it's it, it's really it's really important to be outspoken and uh, with your voice and so forth so that it carries, uh, but also to make sure that you're, you keep your subject as relative to the, to the occurrence as possible, because people are going to pause in what they're doing. They're going to turn. They're going to look. They're going to listen. And if they have to strain, it makes it harder for them to get the message. So basically, always always take in consideration when you are speaking uh, to an audience and such. Make sure you vocalize it well, not just kind of say it and let it be heard by those immediately around you. Enunciate, put it forth in a loud and crisp and clear uh, message. Uh, so that's just one of the things that I really strive to make sure that I do. Now, having said that, as you're listening to my voice right now, my mic on my laptop really sucks. My apologies. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of where I was going with this. So I do apologize for the fact that I am not able to actually expound that particular uh, courtly grace this evening, but I will try to keep it as, as, uh, understandable as possible but please do forgive me for my lack of clarity in my voice <laughs> uh, yeah, unfortunately, there's only so much we can do when tech when technical things fail us so uh so yeah so, so that, that's actually a really interesting point um so i come in this from a heraldic background so things like the knowledge of heraldry and speaking in court and is is super important and i think something doesn't get focused on a lot i know in, in the times that i've looked at nightly training Right, the focus is always on the, the, the stick stuff and the armor stuff and the service stuff. When, and those things are all super important. But we forget about all the little things that go between, right? The little things at night, the little, like, like how do you you deal in court? So if I think back of all the, like, times that I've been sitting in court watching things go on. And, you know, such and such gets called in, they go get an award, cool. Such and such gets called in to do a thing, Cool. But like then one of the knights gets called in to do a thing or one of the, you know, the, 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 the master of defense get called in to do a thing and they come in and it's, and it's a production for them. They don't just come in and go, oh, hey, I've got a thing to give to the crown. Cool. Like whatever. It's a thing. It becomes a stage show. And it's not about them. It's about the crown or it's about the thing that's going on. But it's those little things, the extra little bit of extra effort that goes into that that makes them makes them look better, but also makes the entire thing more interesting. And you don't think about it in that moment, but like that's a that's the courtly graces. That's one of those things of that production value. Yeah, you know, and that's that's one of the things we've talked about several times on, on this show is is the idea that um, you know we're 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 making we're making knights. We're not just making stick jocks. We're not just making fighters. And those knights uh, really should be the, a, a represent uh, rep representative of of the populace and of the the, the people. Um, you know, we we are, you know, being being the the marshal branch of, of the peerages. There is some expectation that that we have. We we'll, we we protect the people. You know, so, I mean, protecting those weaker than yourselves, as as some of the O's say. Um, and you know, if if we are going to represent the people in those ways, we should be expected to represent the entirety of the populace uh, in those ways. Um, and, and you know, I, I think it's safe to be clear too that, uh, you know, having an understanding of these things, having, having supporting the arts doesn't necessarily mean that you're laurel quality artist, you know, it's support of those things. Um, 
you know, having an understanding of, of heraldry as one of the courtly graces does not mean that you are going to be your kingdom herald. You know, that just means you need, you, you know, things like you can't put a color on a color, you know, um, heraldry in the middle ages. I mean, heraldry for us works just like it did in the middle ages. You should, a, a, a squire or a knight should be able to look across the field and see all the shields lined up in front of them and say, watch out for those guys, watch out for these guys, you know, and it's like, and kill that dude right there. Um, and you, you can, you can look across the field and see the heraldry. It works. And, and having an understanding of, um, being able to identify, um, you know, heraldry across the field is, is super important. You know, you should know that, that in the, in the line, in, in the line of spears that you're facing, you should know that that is the king of the opposed of the allied kingdom. You know, you should be able to identify those things. Kyle, you were about to say something. Uh, yeah, no, I was, I was going to expound on what you said. Yeah, I think that the, it's it's funny that, you know, again, as a herald, I'm like, oh, yeah, heraldry is important. But like battlefield recognition, that's literally what heraldry is for. Like right. that's the entire yes. purpose of it. We could say it's for pretties and flags and yay. No, it's for it's for knowing who to stab. That's that's the entire goal of heraldry. Yeah. So, yeah. So in the SCA, it's it, especially when it is not as always obvious when when those when that scrum happens, who you're supposed to be stabbing. It's much easier if you can pick out the right shields. Yeah, and, and I've had I've had those times when you know where people are like, "Oh, my heraldry, I'm going to have a I'm going to have a red dragon on a back on a black background, and you know, want to do some stuff." I just look at him and I say, "You can't do that." Well, why not? I'm like, "Well, basic rules of heraldry." Mm -hmm. so. it, it is very important that we know the basic rules of heraldry and be able to expound on it for for basic consultations and things like that, and and so forth, but. One of the other aspects that I make, make sure I pride myself on is knowing the basics, but also knowing who to send people to to get the get the more detailed information. So not only am I able to say, you know, no, you can't put the red dragon on the black background, but that guy over there is the guy who can actually tell you what you can do. So let me get let me introduce you to this gentleman, and so that or lady, uh, so that the, we can actually get the knowledge that they truly need. Yeah, I mean, get you get your arms that are, you know, take take the ideas that you have, and uh, and find the find some arms that are that are going to match that. You know, when I was when I was a young squire, my knight, you know, was encouraging me to have my arms submitted. It's like I knew I wanted a I wanted a Pegasus on my arms, probably because I'd watched uh, Clash of the Titans one too many times or twelve too many times. Um, <clears throat> and I, I knew I wanted to have a Pegasus, and uh, and I eventually got one. And you know, there was several submissions and there was lots of consultation. It's like, I don't, I, I know the basics of these things, but I don't, I don't know them to the extent to which, um, you know, we had one of our top knights um, <clears throat> or one of our knights who was one of our top heralds that finally uh, made the changes to my arms that got me what I wanted and what I have now. And, you know, and it's amazing, you know, I, and having, having your arms passed um, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of young squires might think that that's just kind of, you know, a suggestion and and I guess it is. I mean, it's it's not a requirement that you. Well, in most kingdoms, it's not a requirement that you have your arms passed um, to be knighted. There are some kingdoms in which you are required to have your arms submitted before you enter crown. Right. So kingdom to kingdom is a little little bit different. But I can tell you, getting your arms passed is badass. I mean, I, I mean, it's like Frank's Red Hots. I put that shit on everything. Uh, you know, when, when I, when, when I got my arms passed and I, you know, I, I did, I, I started putting it on, on everything and, you know, now I've got the, the arms that I have, um, when, when I go to, when I go anywhere in the world and you see that Pegasus issue in a Chevron, you, you, you know, you know what's going on. Yeah. All right. So, so to, to move off the heraldry for a second, because if I start heraldry deep diving, we're never going to end. That's a rabbit hole. I will happily dive down. But, and I say that because I'm, I'm currently the Lantern Herald from Rodier, so like heraldic education is my jam. Uh, so let's not dive down the rabbit hole. But uh, Joffrey brought up a really interesting point that I want to expand on. So Corley Graces, we, we look at all the heraldry and the gaming and all the sort of the knowledge of the things. But politics is an important part of Corley Graces. And knowing who knows things is part of politics, right? So not only knowing how to do a thing, but knowing what you don't know and knowing who knows those things and having relationships with those things. We'll talk about that a little bit with Helga in the networking episode, right? But that's right. one of the things, from, especially in, in medieval times, 
being able to advise the crown on, oh, well, you need a, a carpenter. Let me go find this guy. You need this guy. Let me go find this guy, right? That's a thing. And that's an important thing. Uh, so at, like mundanely, I'm a project manager. And I always tell people, I know what I know and I know what I don't know. But when I know what I don't mm-hmm. know, who knows those things? So that I can go fix that problem when I have one. So that, that's a great point. That's actually one yeah. of the things that I pride myself on is, is I know just about everybody in the kingdom. And I have right. a very good idea of who can do what. So if I need something or if someone needs something and comes to me, I can usually put the people together that can make the thing happen. So, and again, like he says, I mean, that's, that's, that's politicking, which is, you know, truly a courtly grace. If you do it properly, it's a courtly grace. Yeah. There's, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of people who, uh, who kind of poo poo the idea of, of, uh, you know, politics. So it's like, I don't want to do this because that's just politics. Well, the reality is if you get more than two people together, you have politics. I mean, you know, I mean, that's, that's, that's just human nature. Right. I mean, you, you need to negotiate with other people to be able to, you know, get things done that are in the best interest of, of everybody involved. And um, as as knights, um, for me, as, as, as a royal peer, having having sat those thrones before. Yeah, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of times when when I have to call up the crowd and say, maybe this isn't what you think it is. Or I'm sorry, Your Majesty, maybe that sounded like a maybe that sounded better in your head. Um, and the reason I have to say those things is quite frankly, because people have had to say those things to me as well. <clears throat> like, yeah, it may sound like a good idea, but let's write this down on paper and then say it out loud and see how it sounds. And sometimes you need to do that. And yeah, that, that, that's, that's part of politics. And, and I think, you know, that also kind of leads into something else I wanted to kind of touch on, about, you know, about courtly graces and as, as kind of a over generic concept is, um, that sort of politicking involves uh, things like interkingdom anthropology, right? Right? Oh, you're going. To, oh, you're going to this kingdom for their big winter event, right? It's like, oh, you're going to go to Candlemas up in the mid realm. Um, you're going to go to Burka out in the East Kingdom. It's like there are things you should know, and that's a case where I think the history and traditions of the SCA are every bit as important to what we do as the history of the Middle Ages. Um, Understanding little things like how many kingdoms are there, you know? And when you look at it from, again, that heraldic perspective, one of the things that I've had some of my squires do in the past is, you know, take a bunch of, take all the heraldry from the 20 kingdoms, fan them all out and have my squires put them in order of uh, kingdom creation. Ooh as a very basic heraldic standard, you should be able to recognize the heraldry of the 20 kingdoms and you should know what, you know, their order of creation. You should know which kingdom came first. Um, And it's, you know, and it's a very basic task that we can do to kind of just, you know, introduce people to the concept of heraldry and, and the history. Cause I think that that history is like super important to what we do. And when you look at all the different kingdoms and, and their very unique um, cultures that they have, um, it's fascinating and it is awesome. And we should have an understanding of that. And that helps us with that politic. I would simply like to say that I think that, uh, Your Grace, I think my squires are not going to like you very much. <laughs> 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 Mm-hmm. So, again, as a herald, I just went, I can get through like five. After five, I lose it. I, I'm done. So yeah, I, I'll, I will. Uh, I'll step up my game, Your Grace. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, that's where, yeah. I can. I, first five, but best I got. Well, you got uh, to. You got. You got Atlantia, Ontario, Calantia, right in the middle of this somewhere. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, like I can get, like, there was a video who was, I think, I think it came out on the SCA main page, uh, sometime during the pandemic where it was literally the, uh, if the, if we displayed all of the kingdom arms in a period fashion, do using the marshalling thing, basically doing them, splitting them out as if they were actually split out from that. Oh, yeah. um, that was really, it, was, it was really cool watching it, like watching, you know, the one turn into the two, turn into the five, like five and watching them split out. That was really neat because, like, watch it like with like when, when you see your kingdom, you try to follow your kingdom, and all the like when he gets like super tiny in a little box in the corner, you know. That was cool. I'll find, I'll find that video at some point. Like I said, I'm pretty sure it's on the SCA main page, but 
Uh, yeah, that's that's an interesting point. So we're talking about inner king of anthropology. And again, I always try to think back to that, the medieval knight you know, mentality. Knights were travelers, knights would visit other kingdoms. You know, and the Herald thing, we talked about this a lot too. The Heralds had to know how courts functioned. So knights had to know how court functioned. Because you need to know how to walk into another kingdom's court and not like offend them. You know, it's a little less drastic. Like you're not going to get beheaded if you go to the West and, you know, spit on the wrong guy. Like it's like, that's not going to happen because you oopsed and backed into the king's car. Like you're not going to get killed. But like, that's the mentality you should have is I'm going into this other person's house. How do I behave differently than I would in Meridies or in Artemisia or in Aiden? Like that's, you have to think about that because there are, there are some drastic different cultures that, you know, we don't consider yeah, I was at uh, I was at Australia one year, and uh, I was uh, inviting a uh, a crown prince of another kingdom to uh, to dinner, and uh, I sent uh, my former squire Timmer over, and he was he was a knight at the time, and uh, also court baron, having been a, a former landed baron, and uh, as as like you know go over there and and you know let his highness know that dinner's at six thirty, and as Timmer was walking out the door, I said Timmer, take your hat, you know, because. Um, you know, maybe it shouldn't matter whether or not you have a a a, a baronial coronet on or not. Um, but that's part of the show. It's like you are mm-hmm. going to a royal encampment to invite the crown prince to dinner. The, you know, like like you were saying earlier, Cal. There is a production to that. There is a show. There is there is protocol uh, to that, and that's all. That's all. Some of the stuff we learn is is courtly graces. It's it's how to present yourself in court and how to, you know, not not look like a not look like a bumbling idiot. If I may, yes, please. Not only is it something that you need to keep in mind for you know for you know presenting yourself in a court, but it is also something that as a peer of the realm, as a peer of the society, as a baron or whatever position you happen to hold that you are also on presentation to the populace, the, the people who have not achieved these ranks that are looking at looking up to you and saying, well, the Baron doesn't ever wear his, wear his regalia. He just kind of sits around and doesn't do anything. You're setting a standard, or the knights, they just sit around the fire, and, and, and you, the only thing to do is fight and, fight and uh, hang out by a the fire. They never actually do anything. That is setting a standard that they are looking up to based upon the rank that you've achieved. You're showing them what it means to be this particular rank, this title. And so as part of your courtly graces, they should extend outside of court and court settings. They should actually extend pretty much everywhere that you are. It's a, it's, it's a part of your representation of the titles and rank that you hold. All right. Uh, I think it was uh, Sir Anton. I was thinking about that. He was, uh, when he was on the Between Two Peers the other night, I was talking about this. He was serving on retinue, you know, as, as, as a knight and doing the whole night thing, he's hanging out with the king and, but they're also, they're friend, like they're mundanely, they hang out. So when they're out behind the, the shed, you know, having a cigarette, they're just kicked back, hanging out, whatever. Mm-hmm. And it was, you know, it was, it was Bill and Jeff hanging out. But the minute one of those members of the populace turned the corner, it was the knight and the king. And they exactly. put that back on and Anton said, he's, he's like, he goes, I took a step back. I dropped my head. And I fell into that. I'm I am retinue. I am retainer. I no longer matter because I'm I'm here for the king, right? I think that that show is important, and it's 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 silly because we often think, oh, we're just hanging out. Like we all go to work Monday morning. Like this is all make believe and play, but it is. It's make believe and play. And let's like if we embrace that a little harder, it becomes such a cooler thing. Like, and that's it's those little things that matter. Yeah, I mean, it's it's it, it's play if if uh, you want to just leave it at that. Um, it's, it's as, it's as real or as fake as, as you want to make it. Um, and as knights and as peers, I think, um, you know, one of the, one of the things that, I mean, the general populace is here to be transported to another time, you know, I mean, that's, that's, that's what a lot of us, you know, view as kind of the, the, the dream of the SEA is those very brief, very fleeting moments where, uh, you are transported in time. And you really are a 14th century knight in a medieval court. Um, and those moments, I get, I'm getting chills just now thinking about it. I mean, those moments are are awe inspiring. Um, they are, they are, they they do give you chills um, when it happens. And 
as peers, I think, especially in court, especially because court is one of the most public settings that we have. Um, court and feast, um, those are some of the most um, public uh, forums that we have for, for those and some of the best opportunities that we have to create the environment where those moments are more likely to happen for more people. Um, you know, the, the most fun for the most people, right? Um, and, you know, by by doing these things and, and, and trying to remember these courtly graces, we are we are creating an environment. I mean, it, you, I mean, you can't make those moments happen, right. right? The only thing you can do is do the best you can to create an environment in which those moments are more natural, na naturally likely to occur, uh, and that's one of those things that we can do. And and as as knights, I think we have a responsibility to do. I refer to that as setting the stage. Yeah, you absolutely. Can, you know, make. You can't control what's going to happen, but it's likely to happen if it's got a place to happen. So it's the, it's the idea of the the you know there there are three parts of a fire, and if you have all three, you're going to have fire. So if we if we put the building blocks out there, a house is going to get built out of them at some point. All right, so we had we have a couple of questions coming in uh, that I want to scroll through here. And I, I'm gonna I'll hit one and then we'll go back and hit a couple others. So. Uh, so Fiken asks, uh, so for somebody who is newer to courtly conduct, uh, new to the SCA, sort of new to the, the idea of that, uh, what aspects of courtly grace would be good to start with? So what is a good starting point uh, to learn more? Go ahead, Jeffrey. Uh, I would say basically starting off with respect and honor, all right? Because if you treat people well and just, you know, if you're not sure exactly what rank they are, just go ahead and give them a little bow and say, you're, you're excellency. No one's going to get offended. They're going to accept that because you're not familiar with what's going on. I mean, I'm referring to someone who has obvious rank and title, calling them your excellency. Obvious being wearing crowns and coronets and that type of thing. So you're going to get most of them correct by your excellency. But if it's someone who's a little higher, odds are they won't even correct you. They'll understand that you're trying and accept that but treat everyone with honor and respect. So um, a simple bow and nod to almost anyone that you meet, even if they're not wearing any signs of rank and title, will go a long way to showing that you are, is, you're striving to, to fit in and to you know, show respect and you know, it most likely will allow you to make a lot of friends. So. Yeah, right? that's, a great, that's a great answer. Um, you know, we, those of us who who have uh, you know royal or noble titles, um, we all understand that um, if you got if you've got the brass hat on, you are at least your excellency. And so, if somebody says your excellency, you you, you acknowledge the effort. Um, and if somebody says what is your proper title, then you can explain that to them. But you don't need to you know you don't need to turn around and say that's your grace, that's your majesty. You don't need to do that. And generally speaking, you know, like Jeffrey said, we don't do that, right? Because we understand that you're making that effort. And, you know, and quite frankly, I have an award of arms. So if you wanted to call me Lord Sean, that, that is also appropriate. If you would like me to list out my titles, I'd be happy to, to, to give you some instruction on how to do that. But you call me Lord Sean, you can even call me my Lord. The whole, the, the whole order structure that we have is based on this premise of everybody is upper level no, or lower level nobility right to, to baseline unless you want to be a peasant um and so that's that's the standard and so if somebody says my lord that's a perfectly appropriate um, part of dress but but to jeffrey's point doing that is probably one of the easiest things you can do to to get started on that to kind of create that environment a couple of the other things that, that you that you can do that i think um are are easy things to do to to kind of you know get your feet wet in the in the social graces um is either games or dance depending on what is provided at at the event if you're if you're at an event where uh, where there is dancing um one of the things about uh period dance for us that was uh th that functions in exactly the same way as it did in the middle ages is uh courtly dance is one of the easiest ways that you can demonstrate that you're more than a stick jock that you can conduct yourself respectfully in a social setting, 
where you're, you're, you know, as you're dancing, you're likely to rotate through several different partners throughout the natural course of the dance. A lot of period dances are set up that way so that you interact with other people throughout the course of the dance. And it is one of the easiest things that you can do to, to show that you have an interest beyond the fighting field, that you can conduct yourself as a, as a, as a gentleman, gentle lady of the, of the court, that, you know, that you can, you know, that you can show that there is more substance to you than, than simply hitting people with sticks. So dance is one of the easiest things that you can do. Um, gaming is another thing you could do, especially if you're at, uh, at war where they're not as likely to have dance. I know at Penzik, they have, you know, big, uh, big, big dance parties in the, in the barn, uh, pretty much every night you can get, you can go in the barn at two o'clock in the morning at Penzik and there's dancing going on, right? You can do that, <clears throat> but you can pack a chessboard or travel chessboard with you pretty much anywhere you go. Um, and you know, and, and again, you know, we, we've talked in previous episodes of the fact that, um, the natural opportunities to display some of these courtly graces are less available than they were when I was a squire. Um, and that's just the, the, the nature of the way that events have, have, have changed and evolved. Um, so you take a chessboard to an event, you find, you know, maybe you find another knight, maybe you find a, 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 a member of another peerage who you don't know and uh, sit down and play a game with them and have a conversation with them over, over a game of chess. Um, so those are a couple of things that you can do that are super easy to do that are well within your control that, um, you know, especially, you know, taking a game board somewhere, you'd be surprised at the number of people is, you know, you catch them early and you see if you can schedule it. Cause you don't want to, you don't want to surprise somebody with that, but you know, catch somebody in the, in, in the early days of, of the tournament and say, Oh, excuse me, sir. After the tournament, would you, can, can I schedule some time with you to sit down and have a game? And uh, it's one of those things you can do where you can have a conversation with somebody um and uh and learn more about these things so uh i posted in the, in the comments there uh the honorific for each of the each of the ranks uh, and the, the point dropper made of, of excellency is probably correct counts and barons the things we have the most of because there are you can't shake a stick in some king that hit in the that hit a court baron it's excellency default to that a duke, a highness, or a, or a, a prince, or a princess, or a king or queen will correct you, but and, and they'll let you know. But yeah, excellency is generally going to be correct. Yeah. Um, and Joffrey has something to say. I want to throw a quick comment on the, what Sean said there about the dancing and the gaming as such. Not only is it a great way to meet people and you know show courtly grace, show substance, it's also a lot of fun. Right. So, yeah. Isn't that why we do this? Because it's fun. So. Yeah. That was all. <laughs> Pick a chess. Pick a game other than chess. There are a hundred other games out there. If you need to know more, you should check out this guy. Watch what you play on Wednesdays. Every other Wednesday. Mm -hmm. uh, game other than chess because eh, chess is boring. Is that a KK production? That's right. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I, I, protocol precedence I think is a great class, uh, and I, it's one one that I teach because I, I enjoy that that aspect of of, of and I I turn that as part of my heraldic life. Um, I, I do the uh, the hat spotting. I like I like sitting and going Duke, Count, Baron, just based on now in Meridiers it's easier because we actually have general sumptuary laws about our coronets. If you go like to the West Kingdom where it's total crown anarchy, they just do whatever they want to with their coronet. It's a little harder, uh, but yeah. So I I enjoy that, especially with a new person. I like I like playing the hey, what's those leaves mean? Hey, what does that mean? And that helps them get educated. I think that's a good place to start. All right. Uh, so we had another question come in, uh, actually two back to back about um, singing things. So first of all, from Her Highness of the Mist, uh, for Joffrey, you have a lovely timbre to your voice. Please tell me that you sing. So Joffrey, do you sing? I would like to apologize that, and that no, I do not. Singing is not one of my. It's not one of my skills that I have. I can't tell a tale. I can sing along. But actually, leading a song is probably not something you would enjoy very much. I think that the misconception has come from the quality of the mic on my laptop. That's <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's not, not, to do it. So, but I, I do love, I do love, like I said earlier, I love uh, setting the stage. So, if you do sing or you wish to hear people sing, come to my camp. 
Excelsior always has a bonfire going. There's always bardic going on. Uh, if it, even if it's pouring rain, we'll open our dining hall and, and put everybody inside. And we'll just keep right on singing. So, and we have several members of my house who are excellent singers. So we'll keep you entertained. Uh, so that actually leads into the next question uh, about, so uh, are there examples other than song, perhaps, of courtly entertainment or perhaps poems encouraged uh, either in period or now? Um, and I know uh, one of your former squires, our Majesty, or our, our current Meridian Majesty, is a, a, a poet in his own right. So yes, I'm he is. You encourage. He, he is, he is a, a, a wonderful singer, bard, storyteller, but he also composes his own poems on a variety of subjects. And it's just incredible watching him work. He'll sit down and say, you know, I have a subject. Three hours later, he's got a 12 stanza. <laughs> piece that people are crying over and he's like well that was the first rendition i mean i'm going to tweak that and you go he's <laughs> incredible at such art yeah and that, that's the thing about uh you know entertaining entertaining the crowd of the populace is uh it doesn't have to be a song uh, not by any stretch it can be any form of of entertainment um so we we have a um we have a competition here in Artemisia called the Bard of Artemisia, <clears throat> and it's it's something that's been going on since uh, since we were a principality. And um, uh, in our our last reign, uh, we the Bard of Artemisia competition that we hosted, um, the person we ended up choosing for that was a is a magician, uh, and he he had a a magic act that he did that was based on uh, on period magic. Um, and and there he is commenting right now. <laughs> that's that's funny. You should bring him up. That was Aslac. <laughs> that was our bar of Artemisia. <laughs> um, yeah, he uh, and 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 he will tell you that he was you know shocked and awed to to have been chosen as, as a bar of Artemisia. But it was wildly entertaining, you know. Yeah. And that's the whole thing is is people you know people should be entertained and you know. Especially, especially at feast. You know, feast is a great opportunity to uh, to to provide entertainment um, as as people are eating and and uh, and you know, you don't have to captivate the crowd in order to do that. Um, you know, a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about um, you know the, the the three stool the three legs of the peerage stool, uh, fighting arts and service. You know, one of the things I talked about is you know you can go to a feast, go table to table, you know, hey, do you guys need some water? Can I get you anything? You can tell a story to a table. You don't have to tell a story to to the crown. You don't have to captivate uh, 200 people to have them listen to, you know, to, to every word you're saying. You can just entertain table to table. Um, but, you know, being able to tell a story or a poem or, um, you know, I've got, um, there's, there's, a, there's a couple of people um, who, in our, in our kingdom who do, um, who, who are Shakespearean trained performers. Uh, and my, my favorite, uh, Shakespeare speech is, is from Henry V and it is not St. Christian's day. It's actually the gates of Harfleur. And in the gates of Harfleur, this is the one where Henry stands before the gates of Harfleur and tells them all the nasty, awful, terrible things that he's going to do. So you might as well just give me the town. Um, and I have a couple of our, of our, of our um, uh, one, one, one person who actually we created as a master of defense in our last reign. Um, he does the gates of Harfleur for me, uh, and it's I love it. It gives me chills every time I see it, and and he's he's brilliant at it. Um, it's one of those things that that it that is one of the ones that I request. Um, and you know, so so anything that's out there, any any way in which you can you can entertain entertain the crown. Um, you know, I know uh, Duke Uther out in the West is his current Majesty of the West. Um, Uther likes to tell some of the the you know the great Irish sagas, you know, like Cuchulain and uh, you know some of the others. And you know, he'll tell you the he'll tell you the story. You know, he's not going to sing you a song, and you probably don't want him to. That's what he'll tell you, <laughs> but he will tell you these sagas, you know, these, these Irish and these Viking sagas, and he is impassioned about them, you know, yes. and that is what's, that's, what's captivating about it is whatever, whatever form of entertainment you take, um, be impassioned about it. And, and, and because if, if, if you're excited to tell a story, 
that's going to that's going to relate. That's going to translate, and people are going to be excited because you're excited to, to tell it. If you have a poem that you, that you have written um, about something that has inspired you, then tell that tale, tell that that poem, so that other people can be inspired by the things that inspire you. Um, you know, write, writing a poem, and I mean, nobody wants to hear the deadpan. You know, <laughs> no, nobody wants to hear deadpan limericks. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, if you have something. You know, if you're impassioned about it, definitely share that because that's, I mean, again, the history and traditions of our society are just as important to to us as, as medieval history. So you don't necessarily have to tell a medieval story. If you can create a story based on something you saw that day or something you saw at Estrella or Gulf Wars or Penzik, you saw somebody do some really incredible thing, write a story about it and share that story because that is important to us. Well, and, and to talk stick jock for a second here, the no shit there I was battle stories. 42 minutes. There you go. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's usually our timeline. We're usually about 40 yeah, about, yeah 40, 40 plus minutes uh, before we start talking stick. Yeah. But yeah, no, so no shit there was. was yeah. Those battlefield stories. So I have a story that I love to tell about the why you don't turn uh, why you don't turn traitors to your crown. Because, you know, the one time uh, a certain warrior who shall not be named decided he was going to take a charge at his princess and miss the knight standing behind the line next to him that blasted him in the back. You know, there's a whole story of that. Like, it's something that I it happened in real life. But if you just expand a little, you just add a little fluff, add a little bit of extra intrigue to it, it becomes a much more interesting tale than just, I, you know, some guy got killed on the field because he, he tried to spear the wrong person, right? That's not an interesting story. But you can take it and tweak it. Uh, so yeah, those are interesting stories and are interesting to more than just spiders if you add that little bit of extra. Yeah, in the uh, Australia 2000, um, there was a, a castle battle that we did that year <clears throat> that um, uh, is famously known as Phaedra's Gate. Um, uh, Joe Angus uh, was king of Kalantir. His, his uh, Lady Phaedra was queen. Um, uh, and it was an epic, epic contest. Um, and it was, you know, uh, vi victory in the face of, of superior odds and that sort of thing. It was an epic contest. Uh, Max Andrixos from Calenteer wrote a song about it called Phaedra's Gate, which is awe-inspiring. I mean, you listen to that song, you're like, wow, I wish I could have been there. Well, I was. I, I was I was the commander of the Allied Army um, at that at that battle. And Drix is a good friend of mine, and I love hearing. I, I'll ask him to sing that song every time, and then I get to tell people my side of it because uh, he was down there on the Calentier Shield Wall, you know, while they were while they were all doing their thing, and I was up uh, dispensing uh, dispensing with the resurrections, and so it was it was interesting. And I mean, like, yeah, that's I mean that's a story that I love to tell because it was we were outnumbered, we were outgunned, we knew it. That was the that was kind of the idea. And, and we ended up winning and uh, being able to tell that story is, uh, it is something that, that, uh, it, that impassions me for sure. I love telling that story. So I had a comment come in about the, about the idea of some storytelling uh, that's interesting that I'd like to hear your thoughts on. Uh, so dinner conversation at feast can be fun to prep for. Ask philosophic SCA questions. So not only telling a story, but perhaps leading a conversation, asking a question. What's your What's your thoughts on that, there, Joffrey? Well, I mean, a lot of times when you're sitting around at a feast table, you've got a captive audience, right. and but so many times it just turns into people just sitting and chatting and so forth like that. So I really love that idea of actually posing it forth as a question to create thought to bring us more into the ideas of. And, uh, of what we're supposed to be doing, you know, which you know, which of course is you know medieval. You know, feasting and entertainment at that time. So, but I mean, I, I love that idea. I'll, I'll see if I can't actually be bringing stuff more like that into into my uh, feasting and, and, and such. And I mean, going back to something that uh, Sean said earlier, I love that idea of as a bard or an entertainer going just and doing the table, you know, right. entertaining one table versus. So, I mean, those you still have an intimate group of people that you're dealing with. But you're expounding upon the ideals of, of, of what we're trying to achieve within that small group. I mean, I, I really love that idea. So, 
Yeah. And, you know, I mean, it, it's, you know, that sort of entertainment is, is a, is a progression as well. Um, it can be, it, it can start with, it can start with you telling poems. It can start with you telling stories. Um, it can start with you telling a joke, um, in, in those little settings, you know, going table to table. Um, you know, I, I, I am not, uh, I, I'm not voice trained as as a singer. <clears throat> I mean, my 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 singing voice is is passable at best, um, and that's just not something I've put a lot of effort into. Although I have plenty of resources if I decide that that's something I want to do. And I see her her highness of the mist in the in the comments there, so I know she's more than willing to help. Um, but uh, when I when I first when I first started singing in the SCA. I mean, it was like the moose song, you know, and the three and, you know, and swing low and stuff like that. And, you know, I got called out at some events for the, you know, the, my timeliness. Um, and, and then I realized at some point that uh, perhaps if I was going to continue singing, perhaps I should uh, have some songs that are a little more suitable for public consumption, as I say. Um, and, uh, the, the the first time that I that I sang uh, on on that in that capacity was um, again another another song that my friend Drex wrote. Um, it's the Requiem for the Who's Carl um, from Calentier, and we had a, a gentleman who was a Who's Carl from Calentier who lived in our kingdom for a while and bre and brought us the songs. Um, he would sing all the Calentier songs for us, and um, a good friend of mine happened to be crown happened to be king at the time. And he's like, you know, I really miss, uh, I really miss Gillian singing these songs. And so I learned how to sing the record for the Who's Carl, and I sang it for Basil at, at one of our big events. And that was the first time that I really kind of sang like something other than you know what what you sing around your personal campfire. Um, and uh, and that was that was kind of the kind of the beginning uh, of of that for me. And again, it's something that. I got to learn a song from one of my best friends. Um, and, and I got to learn it from another one of my friends and I got to share that with all my other friends. That that's, that's passionate to me. That's, that's something that, um, you know, I, I still love singing that song. Um, we sing born on the list field when one of our, one of our squires is knighted here in Artemisia. Um, and that's a, a tradition that I had not started, but I, I carried on. Um, and again, you know, my, my, my voice is not classically trained as it were, but that's all been an evolution. And it, it, sing, it started with me singing some really kind of shitty songs. Got to start somewhere, right? Yeah. Uh, all right. So we got uh, a question came up earlier uh, by the host of Ask Tonight's Lab, Baron Logan Path Warden. Uh, but I, and I'm going to expand on it, and I'll bring his question up. So there's an idea of nobility, and I think this is important in those courtly graces. We're, we are all in the FDA supposed to be nobles and of noble birth and of noble ranking, right? So because, you know, the nobles are the ones that attend the feast. They're, they're attending the tournaments. So, you know, the peasants won't show up at the tournaments. So we're all nobles of some sort. I've seen occasionally in certain, like, the in the deed or the, like, the Viking raid at Gulf Wars where that nobility actually has a cost, where you have to employ a person. Uh, so, like, if you show up to the Viking deed, uh, Viking raid at Gulf Wars in uh, in Detroit wearing Lamellar, you are required to bring with you two supporting fighters in lesser armor to show your station, because only a Jarl would have had would have had that nice of armor, right? Um, so, that idea of employing people in the SCA, right? We 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 talk about betting a lot. We we have coin that we have or bottles or or trinkets, but the idea of employing somebody doesn't come up a whole lot. But as lords, as lords of the court, we would have had retinue. We would have had our own, you know, ser uh, servants, serfs, employees. Um, so Logan asks, should a count or better employ a personal herald? Do you think that would bring more people into the fund? So this is, he asks this back during the heraldry question, but I think it sort of expands into should we as lords of the court and as, and as higher nobility uh, – employ others to do service like that for us. And, and what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think um, as, as a knight, I mean, the, the, the whole point of this particular episode is that's something that we obviously should be able to do uh, on our own. Uh, but Logan brings up a good point. 
um, you know, because because again, it's it's the most fun for the most people, right? Um, one of the things that that uh, one of the many one of the many many things I learned from from my night uh, Duke Bryan's um, is is uh, especially as as Crown, you know, um, so many people in our society are never going to have have the experience of sitting in the thrones and we have an opportunity to 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 drag them along on our coattails and and to share the really exciting experience that it, that is being the crown um and i think as knights to to a lesser degree we can we can do the same thing you know as 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 logan was saying i think i think he, this is not a bad idea at all um as a as a count, as a duke, um, yeah, I can. If 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 I were to employ a herald per se, um, that's including more people in the fun. You know, I mean, if I have an announcement to make at court, uh, I could have I could have the crown herald in, invite me in, uh, or I can hire out a herald to come in and say Duke Sean's got an announcement and. You know, pray heed his words and and all the good stuff. Sure, I could do that. I mean, that's that could very well be a way to get more people involved and to uh, to add to to some of that fun. Jobber, right. I totally agree. I mean, it's it's a wonderful idea, and you know, it for for our crown lists. Whenever I fight crown list, we actually you know, hire a herald and you have our own personal herald. They provide heralds. We always. You know, bring our own because it's it adds to our procession, our pop, our circumstances, and and we also have a bit more control over what they're going to say and do. But the idea of uh, actually having a herald step forward, you know, having one on retainer, so if you know you're going to be in court, you know, have one step up. I love that. So, huh, more ideas. Yeah, yeah, more ideas. <laughs> so, well, and also, so, and this is actually a question for both of you: Do the two of you pay your squires? So squires in period would have had a salary, would have had like obviously they would they would have been provided their armor or weapons and thing, but obviously you're not actually buying your I mean you, I'm, some, I'm sure you buy presents for your squires occasionally, but do either of you have a salary that you give your squires? Because I think that's a neat thing. That's a you know a little thing, and I mean I mean like you know here's your five coins that I had minted, and not like I'm giving you a hundred bucks. Like do you, do you, is that something either of you ever done? Yeah, they get it. They get it. I mean, go, go ahead, your grace. Please. No, I was just saying, yeah, they get a pile of fox furs at the end of my bed in case I need something in the middle of the night. It's very curious. It's very curious. <laughs> I just want to sleep on the floor. Uh, but, you know, I mean, I've never done anything quite like that, but again, that's, one of, that's, that's kind of a nice idea, but I have a fear that most of my squares probably wouldn't actually be earning it because I have a bad habit of doing more for them than they do for me. And I've been able to show up to this early and have their tents set up waiting for them by the time they got there. I'm, I'm a horrible knight. I, I really am. It's, it's, it's pretty sure that's why I made you a pelican, right? And, and, and you know what comes with that? It's a little service thing there. A delegation, right? <clears throat> uh, well, uh, a lot of that's due to timing. When I am able to arrive versus when they're able to arrive. But, you know, it's just, I kind of like that. Well, maybe I'll set up a uh, payment schedule for them and see how many coins they earn by the end of the year. So, uh, so his Majesty has graced us uh, in the comments here. I will bring up. He he makes an interesting point. Uh, there is a balancing act of creating the appearance of high nobility, but also maintaining a sense of humility and service. Right. Yeah. So uh, well said, Majesty. I think that is interesting. Uh, that 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 it really is, is correct, and that's that's the hard line I think we see in the SCA is we want to play the game, but also we have to like, we have to do the work at the same time, right? So, so like finding that balance is interesting. And I think there's, again, it's those little things. So when you do have a herald, like say, hey, I need to make an announcement. I need you to go, uh, you know, announce that we're about to start this thing. Give that kid a coin, like f find the find the herald and give him a coin. And I, and I mean, like, again, go find the place to mint coins or mm -hmm. go to the flea market and buy a bunch of little bracelets or, you know, find an artisan and mint a bunch of, uh, you know, torque bracelets. I know um, yeah, Baru, his grace Baru, when he was on the throne, he had a bunch of little, uh, like the Viking Norse bracelets that he would leave for artisans in the ANS competitions. That was the thing he did. Hey, that's a neat thing. Here, here's a bracelet, right? Uh, and he, pro he probably bought, you know, a box of them. 
on discounts from from Wish or something, but it's a thing he did that was a way he could pay his artists as when he was crowned. Um, so those little things. Then also, yeah, you're out out back washing dishes, right? That's so again, there's that balance there. Yeah, I mean, and that kind of you know raises the point too that that uh, you know when we're talking about the the courtly graces and and being that well well rounded individual, um, we are recreating the romantic ideal of chivalry. Right. Yeah. We are not recreating knighthood as practice in the Middle Ages. Correct. Because yeah. those guys were some real assholes. Um, you know, and that, I mean, knight, knights in the Middle Ages, uh, they have a they have a job to do and they they lived on their title, they lived on their 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 name. Um and you know and to quite to his majesty's point. Um you know, we're we're not that kind of knight, right? No, we we are we we are trying to recreate. I mean, what I view as the 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 Sir Nigel uh, model of of chivalry, you know, which is the Arthur Conan Doyle, you know, Victorian era um, vision of chivalry. You know, it's it's a much more romanticized vision of chivalry um, than than what was practiced in the Middle Ages. Because you know, <clears throat> you know, if if people, you know, if if, if we really wanted to be you know, act, act our station. Um, me acting like I'm a real medieval duke uh, is not really going to get me a whole lot of company. Yep. You, you do have to find that balance. You do have to find the, that humility. Correct. All right. So we had a question. Um, find it. Actually, we'll go with them. All right. So. Uh, this is a, a, a sort of general statement or a general question here. And then there's another question about the Corley Grace that I'll find in a minute. Uh, so as an unbelted fighter, um, someone's looking to become a squire. Uh, what is the best advice you can give for getting the attention of a knight? And I think we've already mentioned something about this, uh, the idea of, you know, pick up a game and uh, go ask a knight to play a game with you is one way. Uh, is there another way that you think uh, outside of fighting? Because, again, we can't talk about fighting. Uh, what's another way you think to get an attention of a knight uh, about becoming their squire? Yeah, go ahead, Jeffrey. Yeah, go ahead. One of the best ways is to talk to them about it. All right? Because a lot of a lot of knights, and you, you don't have to actually walk up to them and say, "Hey, I want to be your squire," but walk up to them and say, "Hey, I'm upcoming. I would, yeah, I, I'd like at some point to become a squire, and I would like to talk to you about." what I can do to further my chances with any given knight. It doesn't even have to be a knight that you specifically want to be squared to. It might be someone who's close enough to you where you can talk to him, but you know, he might not be the one you're actually looking at. And if, you, if it is a case like that, during the conversation, you, perhaps you can mention to him, you know, I'm really interested in, in Sir Sven, and I really think that that's a direction I'd like to go in. It's, odds are in the aftermath of that conversation, he's going to say, hey, Sven, we got, we got a guy over here who's kind of interested in maybe being your squire. And that puts you on Sven's radar. But, you know, you have to communicate in some way. And honestly, the easiest way to communicate is by talking. Yeah. Grace? Yeah, I've had, I, you know, I've had a number of people uh, who I have had conversations with um, about the process. Uh, and and really trying to trying to find the best fit uh, for them, um, I you know and and one of the things that when I when I was first looking at taking squires, I'd kind of looked at some of the other knights that were around me and some of the ways ways that things were done and you know what I want to do and what I don't want to do. Um, and you know one of the things that has really kind of always irritated me is is that knight who is going to you know, take somebody who shows the, you know, the least amount of prowess in, in, you know, the shortest amount of time and say, you're, you're going to be my squire, uh, you know, and you're leaving this uh, young unbelted fighter with this idea that, well, this knight asked me to be a squire. So I have to say yes. Um, <clears throat> and so a lot of times I've had that conversation with people that have shown that potential and I've just told them, you're going to, people are going to start asking you questions and, I am happy to have that conversation with you and try to help you find the best fit. And, and I'm not saying this to reserve you for myself because um, <clears throat> I may not be the best fit for that person. Right. right. Um, but I want to make sure that that person feels like they don't have to say yes, just because somebody said, you're going to be my squire. 
Um, cause that's something that just really just bugs the hell out of me. Um, and so I, I've had that conversation a lot and, and those, a lot of those people have gone on to be squired to other people and have become knights in their own right. Um, I had, um, I had one of, uh, I had a gentleman a number of years ago who, uh, <laughs> had been fighting for a number of years elsewhere and came to practice the first time here in our local group. And, uh, after I got done fighting him, he said, so what's a guy got to do to get a red belt around here? I I'm like, look at that. Uh, you know, there's there's lots of great options. We have a lot of great nights here, a lot of active nights. Just, you know, hang out with some of these guys and see, uh, you know, see see which one of them ends up being a good fit for you. Like, just just hang out with them and fight with them. And, and you know, just as, as Joffrey said, just talk to these guys. You know, they're, they're all willing to talk. Well, you know, then he wouldn't leave me alone. And he ended up becoming my squire and ended up becoming a knight and a duke. Um you know, like, so it, it, it worked out for him. Okay. Um, you know, I, I just, you know, a, a lot of those, a lot of those relationships, uh, the night square relationship to me is, 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 is sacred. Um, and that's the best word I can, I can use to describe it because the night square relationship I had with my night was just more than I could, I could, I could possibly ask for. Um, and it is very intimate. Um, it, it is very special and it should be a, re a reflection of a, an, an existing friendship, if at all possible. Um, I had one of my squires, uh, Sir Tierlock, who will be joining us for an episode on looking the part. Is that next? Is that our next episode? Yep. That's next right so, uh, Tierlock, uh, <clears throat> he, he, um, he was a guy that uh, I, I I thought I was I, I I thought I had enough squires, uh, all three of them at the time, uh, and you know I was like I, I've caught my limit. I'm good. I'm not going to have any more. I don't want to have a big cheering section. I don't want any of that. Right. And then I realized that if I if if he would have been squired to somebody else, it just would have broken my heart. Uh, and, and I just realized that that I had already had that relationship with him, and I just kind of. You know, just as we recognize peers, we don't make peers. I recognize that relationship, and he ended up being the first of my squires to get knighted. Um, and you know, I, I can't say enough about how close I am with with him, and and that was a relationship that already existed. So for me, that's kind of how I went with that one. When I was, you know, I didn't want to pick up a bunch of guys, um, but I, I could not have passed that up. I, I just knew it would have broken my heart. But you know. There, there are any number of ways to do it, but the best way is, you know, just have that conversation and just, you know, and, and, and take a chance, you know, um, you know, Cherlock grew up in a part of our kingdom where the culture was, you simply do not ask a knight to be squired. Right. You, you, you like, you just don't. And, and that was just kind of the culture that they kind of convinced themselves of. <laughs> there are plenty of knights out here who say, I'm not going to take somebody as a squire who doesn't have the balls to approach me about it. Right. I, you know, I don't, I don't have a hard and fast rule. I've asked people to be my student. I've been asked by others. Sometimes they say yes. Sometimes we say no. Take them as a man in arms. They find somebody else or don't. You know, I don't have a hard and fast rule about how this has to happen. But, you know, if you just have that conversation, if and especially, again, look around. Keep an eye out for the people that, like, when you see somebody on the field, there's going to be that day where you look at somebody walk across the field and you say, that's what I want to be. And when you see that person that is what you want to be, go talk to them. And, 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 and really be bold and say, I want to be like you. And, right? and then later, right, invite them on your YouTube show. <laughs> That'll work. How, how's that working out for you, Cal? <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the things I'd like to actually uh, caution people on is be being very cautious about the idea of the guy who you go talk to. And he says, "Yeah, yeah, I'll give you a square belt." That's he doesn't know you. He doesn't doesn't really hasn't had a chance to get to know you, and so forth. So a little the ones who are a little too quick on the gun are probably, they probably got a lot of squires already and so forth. They're probably not as thoughtful to the end game as they should be, in my opinion. Uh, one, of the things, one of the things I do, and I do this with all my associates, 
I, I set a time frame. It's usually six months to a year. I'll take you as my man at arms. And at the six month mark, we're going to talk. You know, we're going to, of course, be talking in the, in the intern, but we're going to sit down around the six month mark and we're going to have a serious heart to heart as to how this is going. And if both of us are still on the same page, we'll take it the second six months. But it has actually, you know, been, you know, in, in one particular case, you know, I met a guy, he, you know, he, he and I actually had known each other for several several years, but he dropped out of the SCA for a while. He came back, and when he came back, he immediately started saying, hey, you know, I'm interested in being your squire. So we hung out together at several events, and eventually I agreed, I'll take him as a man-at-arms. And in that first six months, I saw that he was not as enthusiastic about the things that I expect of a squire. So coming into that six month conversation, I'm sitting there, well, I'm gonna have to, you know, break the bad news to the guy. This probably isn't gonna work. So we sit down at that conversation, said, all right, well, I'll tell you what, I'll let you open up. How do you think things been going? He's like, you know, I love you, Jock, but this ain't working. You expect too much of me. <laughs> so it was it was very much a situation where he wanted his weekends, he worked really hard all week. So he wanted a bit more leisure time in his weekends. And as my squire, I expect to treat my man at arms as my squire so they get a taste of it. And right. it worked out very, very well for both of us in the aspect that no red belt had been given, no formal obligation had been created. So he stepped away from being my man at arms with no hard feelings from, from me or him and no blemish on his record, per se, as far as the you know, other nights saying, hey, wait a minute, Joffrey just kicked him off, off the team. There must be something wrong with this guy. So, but he knows also that when he gets to that point where he's interested again, if he needs somebody to talk to somebody for him, I'm there for him. Great guy. He'll make somebody a great squire. Right. Just didn't make me a good squire. And I did not make a good night for him. So take that time, even after the initial discussion, to get a chance to wear the shoes for a while if you have that option. So it, it, can, it can open your eyes a lot more than just the, conversations and knowing a guy from a distance. Yeah, I, I do. I, I do the exact same thing. I take somebody as a man in arms um, to make sure that that relationship is going to work because again, it is a very intimate relationship. It's a very, uh, very yeah, sacred, intimate. And, you know, I mean, you're taking somebody as part of your family, really. And, um, yes. and, 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 you know, the time as a man in arms, as, as you said, Joffrey, everything I expect of a squire, I'm going to expect of my man in arms because the whole point is, is this right for you? They're, they're, you know, you, you don't get to just hang out as a man at arms and then I make you a squire and all of a sudden there's more work to do. Right. Nope. Now I expect all these things it's like, you know, I, the, this is what I'm going to expect of you as a squire, because quite frankly, this is what I expect of you when you become a knight. Right. You need to know these things. Um, and, and, you know, that, that squire of mine that said, you know, what I got to do to, to make this black belt go red. I'm like, well, here's what you gotta do. And I sent him on a brutal quest at Australia, which he ended up, you know, completing. And I said, if you do this quest, then I'll I'll make you a squire. And that quest included, you know, uh, you gotta go talk to some pelicans, you gotta go talk to some laurels, some laurels, some uh royal consorts. These are the things you need to know as a knight and as my squire. And if you do these things, then I'll make you a squire because like you like this is what these are the things you need to know. And if that's and and to Jeffrey's point, if this, if this isn't what you want from that relationship, we will find you the person that fits best for you. Right. So a, a quick follow up, and then I want to address one question in the comments as far well, we're a little off topic, but I think this is an important topic. And and by the way, Sean, I've already added a uh, a Squire Knight relationship topic to our topic list because I think that's another episode we should do. Yeah, I think um, that's a good one. Negotiations and things. Okay, so first of all, the the and again, I'll speak of the unbelt in in the room. The squire protege apprentice belt is not a sign of rank. Mm -mm. It means literally nothing outside of their relationship with that person. It is it is just like a wedding band. It's a it's a symbol of a relationship. It is not a rank. It is not an award you're you're winning. It's a it is a it is a burden you are taking on. Let me yeah. Squire me, squire's not a title. It's a sentence. Correct. Um, I can you, that. you do not have to be squired to a knight to learn from that knight. You do not have to be squired to become a knight. True. Always ever squired. Right. No one will hire me. 
fair. Uh, so, so like, you know, I, 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 I had a lot of nights I talked to when I, when I was coming up in, in the SCA or, or sort of starting that path and, and every one of them, there was, there was a little, they were too far away or there's something wrong that wasn't a good fit. But there's also still a ton of nights that I talk to that I'm going to learn from in my path to to be a knight. knight. I happen to find a pelican that was a good fit for me as a peer to teach me the peer-like qualities. She can't teach me fighting, but she can teach me everything else. And that and so all those all the other the franchise we talk about, you can learn from somebody other than a knight as well. So remember that. Uh, and and that goes to the point. The question was the is there is there a difference in uh, for laurels and in pelicans as well. And the answer is yes. This conversation is different for every person. It doesn't matter what the peer is. The conversation you have with that person is different per person. And the opinions of the of the two gentlemen on the show versus the thousand other peers out there, all of them are different. Um, you get 10 nights in the room, you're going to get 15 opinions about how those things happen. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. But along the same lines, if you're looking to be a, if you're looking for a student teacher relationship, um, it's, uh, you know, very much the same. If, if you are, if you consider yourself on an art path and you want to, uh, be an apprentice to a, a, to a Laurel, um, I'd say the same, same advice applies. Um, you know, I mean, you can, you can find somebody when, when you see that person, when, when you, when you see that person, you say, that's what I want to be. Um, yeah, talk to that person. And, and, and to Cal's point, um, if you want to be a Laurel and the person that, you want to be like is not a laurel. You can still talk to them about a relationship. You know, it may not be an apprentice type relationship because I, I don't think it's appropriate for somebody who's not a laurel to take an apprentice. Just as like I don't think it's appropriate for somebody who's not a knight to take a squire. Agreed. But if that's the person you want to be like, and you think they can guide you in some way, um, you, you can have a relationship with that person. Even if it's kind of outside your discipline. On that note, right there, you don't even have to truly even take a belt from someone. If that right. person is, is of a quality that, that, like you said, is someone I want to be like this person, but I want to be a laurel and that's a pelican. You know, if you talk to them, and say, "Hey, I want to be your student." And, you know, I, it's not the path. And if, they, if they're like, "Well, I I'm, I can't put a belt on you because you really want to be an apprentice." Well, can I still just be your student? Can I check in you, learn the you like qualities? And, you know, it doesn't even have to wear a, a belt of the, uh, uh, to the individual. You can still learn from them directly. Or even if that concept isn't something you're comfortable with, you can still be their friend, hang out with them, learn from them in, under any circumstances. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if somebody's got a household, you can be part of their household without being in fealty to them, without... Right. You know, not being a squire apprentice project. Yep. Yeah. All right. So we got, uh, let's, let's see. I think we got one more uh, question and then we're going to do our final thoughts. We are a little late, uh, but it's okay. We're, this, I, I'm enjoying this conversation. So, like, I always, I always try to keep it to an hour, but you know what? I'm not going to cut a good conversation short. All right. So, um, I just lost it. I hate when the chat updates. There it is. Okay. So, and this is on the same lines. So we're talking about the, that sort of that, that student relationship. I think that's, and that's an important title to look at there. Uh, so as a non-peer, uh, the question says, I appreciate the courtly graces are universal for all SCA members. This is a peerage thing, not specifically even a night thing. What strategies do you do to help your students to encourage courtly graces? Uh, not only in themselves, but also in others. Jobber? Yeah, go ahead, Jeffrey. Well, I mean, I don't have anything specific you know, set or installed or anything like that where you you must do this checklist or so forth like that. But one of the, my basic guidance on that is is that know that I'm watching and know that others are watching, and go forth and do, and I will guide you if you stray. And so, and it basically, it's just I'm, I'm going to keep keep watch over them and make sure that they're doing something or, or not doing something that that is outside the court of graces. And if I see somewhere where they need a little guidance, I'm going to have a discussion about, about the specific items. And of course they can always come ask questions, but I don't have a checklist or anything like that. It's just, it's just a, it's a free flowing, you know, I hate to say be more like Joffrey because uh, we don't need to with me. <laughs> 
Uh, I mean, it's, it's basically offer them guidance and, and 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 make sure that they don't stray. So, you you said something in the before show that I, I want to bring up that that you you expect your squires to not be as good as you, but to be better. Yes. Than you. Yes. It is, I love that mentality. That's true of, of all my associates, and I, I tell them this. I never expect you to be as good as I am. I expect you to end up being better. So, going off, they're probably not going to be there, but the goal is to get them to where they're better, and when they're better than I am in whatever, and it doesn't have to be something I specifically even do, but they're, 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 their goal is to strive to be better than I am, and that's that's when I see them as succeeding. And I try to set up my bar. So... Yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> Joffrey encourages yeah, to, here. to learn a song and always represent the kingdom and household with honor and courtesy. So there you go. So, so apparently there was a checklist, Joffrey. You just didn't know it. You had, you had, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think. I, I, think uh, I, I think especially when. <laughs> when I think especially when when we're talking about encouraging uh, the courtly graces in others. Um, I, I like you know. Likewise, I I don't have a specific ch checklist. I, I you know, I don't really have a you know my my squires have to you know do a song or do a poem or you know whatever. Uh, I honestly I I think that's something that I just try to lead by example. Um, and you know I I I, I genuinely enjoy all of those aspects of the courtly graces. Um, I like I like playing the games. Uh, I I like the dance when when time permits. Um, you know I I like uh, I particularly like entertaining at feast. I I like entertaining the crown. Um, you know I I I have an appreciation of of heraldry. Um, you know and and, and encouraging people to display their heraldry and find good arms uh, arms that they're excited about that, that when you look at it and you go yeah that's me. Um, I, I try I try to ins inspire that by. By example, I think, um, and and I don't know when it, when I say it like that, it kind of seems like a lazy answer. Um, but uh, you know, I've got uh, I've got seven of my former squires who are knighted, um, and none of them would be would be knighted without a sense of courtly graces, because um, that's something I just won't allow. So somewhere along the lines, they all picked it up to to some degree or another, and. You know, when I think about some of the squires that I have um, that are that are now knights, you know, and I look at, you know, I, I mean, I'm just ridiculously proud of, of the knights in my line. Um, watching them, watching how they encourage others, as 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 Joffrey said, I expect you to be better than me. Um, and watching watching the way that, that my squires have carried on the lineage and are encouraging others and making the fun for other people uh, is just inspiring to me. Yeah. Uh, uh, so a final word from his majesty. I think it's a good piece of advice and always grab two beers when you head to the cooler. <laughs> Somebody's going to need one. Somebody's going to need one. There you go. All right. I figured that was an appropriate and, and cause I, Hey, that's a courtly grace. Taking care of your night. Hospitality. So I think that's important. <laughs> All right. So uh, let's do a little bit of uh, channel business and then we'll do final thoughts. So coming up on Calabar's Corner this Wednesday, I'll be joined by Fiken, uh, the Squirrel Casino Magnet for Hounds and Jackals. Uh, this is a fun little race game that uh, I recently uh, looked up actually by request. So I'm looking forward to that one. Uh, Thursday, actually, uh, I will be uh, I'm being graced uh, by Baron Logan Path Warden to take over his show. Uh, As tonight's live, I'll be hosting for Sir Pietro and Sir Chinwa. Uh, Logan has some uh, family business to attend to, so I get to do As tonight's live. So I'm looking yeah. forward to it. it'll be fun. I, it's what's it's you know now that I'm doing this show, I'm a little more I'm I'm ready for it. I think so. I'm <laughs> that. Uh, and then this Sunday, uh, we, I'll be joined by my lovely ladies because uh, it is Valentine's Day for Coffee with Cal to talk about participating with your partners and how we have the three of us and, and sort of uh, we embrace each other and help each other in our uh, various paths. Uh, and then as Sean mentioned, the following Sunday for the next What Makes a Night, we'll be talking about looking the part. So the idea of, you know, you got to look like a knight if you're going to be a knight, right? Uh, and that's, you said, uh, Sir, Sir, Sir Tillock will be joining us yep. for that. Apparently, yeah. again, I have not met, but from what I have heard, it is the uh, 
the quintessential that man looks like a knight, and that's the important thing. Nice. So there we go. All right, so gentlemen, uh, let's do some final thoughts on the courtly graces. Um, what is your, uh, if you had to sum it up in one sentence, what is the courtly graces to you? Joffrey. Hey, Jeffrey. Well, I'm going to take the words right out of her, uh, out of her, high, her majesty's mouth. Be excellent to one another. <laughs> as, as long as you are being, you know, you know, graceful and and pleasant and trying to to be, you know, courtly and such, you're going to succeed at least on some level, and people will notice and it will be appreciated. So that's your first step: be excellent to one another. And, and revel on, dudes. Right? And revel on, dudes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, again, this 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 whole. Yeah. This this whole series uh, has been about the things that make a knight besides fighting. Um, there there are plenty of places where you can learn how to how to swing a stick better. Um, the thing about the courtly graces is this is the part of being a knight that that really makes you socially acceptable. The the, the this is the part about being a knight that makes people want to be around you. And if you are going to be the guardian of the people, if you are going to be the Bahadur, as as the Mongols say, the the, the hero of the people, um, you should be you should be worthy of that title. They you you should be somebody who they want to be defending them, to want to be representing them, and the courtly graces, the the gaming, the dancing, the court appearance. The understanding of heraldry, the understanding of society history, the politics, as Cal said, all of those things are important to represent the populace and to represent the people of the SCA. Um, and people need to know that you have their best interests at heart when you are the martial wing of our society, when when you are the when, when, when you are the people who are, you know, doing violence in their name, um, they need to know that that uh, that you are more than just a stick jock. And these are some really easy things to do to distinguish yourself in that regard. And as Joffrey so eloquently stated, they're just fun to do. So have fun. Do nightly things. Let us do yeah. nightly things. Let us do nightly things. So, uh, so my final thoughts, uh, actually, I'm, I'm going to quote another knight. Uh, there's a quote I heard on Ask Knights Lab, uh, Sir Ryu uh, from the East Kingdom. He said that the, the courtly graces, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing a bit, but I hope you'll forgive me. The courtly graces were the difference between the, uh, the an asshole with a stick and a knight. Anybody can pick up a stick and swing a stick and, 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 and enforce something. The courtly graces make the difference. Well, and it was it was it was Ryu Ryu who who had uh, most recently made a comment saying, um, you know, we need to do a show about uh, you know when it's time to roll up your sleeves and and get in the kitchen and start doing dishes. Um, so yeah, right along those lines, there, Ryu, uh, totally totally on point. Yeah. All right, gentlemen, what has been an amazing hour and a half, uh, Joffrey? I, I thank you again. Uh, I, I enjoyed our chess game, and I enjoy I enjoy every minute I get to spend with you. You, as I mentioned, you are definitely one of the knights that are. Uh, the top of the mark in my book. So thank you for your time. Get out more often. I just want to point that out. So. <laughs> Look, I, I, I know good when I see it, and I don't care what anybody else says about you, sir. <laughs> All right. And uh, Sean, as always, it's a pleasure. I appreciate All you right. for doing this. Joffrey, thank you for joining us. Really appreciate it. It was uh, it was an honor to have you. Thank you, Your Grace. And thank you, Cal. Audience, thank you always for tuning in. And we Marie. Guys. And I'm oh, sorry, Marie. Marie, our Silent Herald. Our Silent is- Herald. Uh, so I, I, I will, I'll brag on her for a moment. She did four hours yesterday for the Trimarian coronation. I don't nice. know. How she's on currently. Yeah. So yeah. Every, was, every, right. every every time we've had Marie doing the Silent Herald for us, it's been fun to watch her go. Oh wait, they're talking about me now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And on that note, gentlemen, we're going to call out a good night. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, tune in later for other stuff. We love you. We thank you. This has been Cal, Sean, Joffrey, and Marie in Cal Bar's Corner. Good night, everybody. All right. Good night. Good night.